Okay. Any other? Okay. All right, I'm gonna let Ravi take over. Um, All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, all right. So it's, uh, I'm going to talk about animal migration and territoriality. But for today, I'm going to talk about migration. And for the next class, I'll talk about territoriality, um, depending on uh, how we go today. Uh, before I start, uh, when I say migration, what comes to your mind? So she's saying moving from one place to another, for example, but moving um, and then returning back. Any other um, answers? What comes to your mind when you hear migration? Nothing, that's also an answer. <laughs> um, well, um, well, I'll tell you what comes to my mind. Um, to my mind, when I say when I hear migration, uh, it, the immigration system comes to my mind, the border security comes to my mind, and, the, and, and some, some weird questions that they ask, like, are you an alien coming here to uh, do illegal activities in the United States? Um, yeah, so those are the kinds of questions that, uh, that I get reminded of uh, when I think of migration. But that's a different kind of migration. We're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about animal migration. Can anybody define what migration is? What is migration? You can be wrong, people on the Zoom, anybody, if you want to jump in. OK, an animal group of animals moving to another place for breeding or food resources or to escape inclement uh, seasonal weather. And usually it means returning uh, at some point to where they started. Right. Directly um, or circuitously. Right, that, that, that kind of um, encompasses uh, most of the things about migration. Does anybody else want to contribute? What is migration? How do you define migration? Is there anything that you can add to what Jerry said? No? All right, so like Jerry said, it is uh, an animal. It can be one animal or a population of animals moving periodically. Um, and it's usually over long, long distances and they, they typically get back to the place where they started. So it's a cyclic movement of um, animals and it could be periodic, it could be seasonal, uh, it could depend on other um, periodic uh, timelines as well. Uh, apart from Jerry, can anybody else uh, give examples? Because Jerry got, this, uh, Jerry got to define what migration is. Uh, can anybody else give me examples of migration? I need at least three. I'm not gonna move un unless you give me three examples. Any examples of migration? Uh, like the monarch butterfly migration? That's a good one, yeah. We're gonna discuss that today as well. Monarch fly uh, migration is a very good example, yeah. Any other examples? Think of uh, uh, migration um, videos that you may have seen on, on whatever TV channels or documentaries or Mig maybe you migrating yeah. whales whales yeah that's a really good one as well whale migration and sometimes you get these uh, whale uh, watching seasons and so you get to see them only in those seasons uh, i don't know if you've done it it's it's really fun um, watching them migrate yeah another example anybody else uh, elephants maybe, looking for water. sorry yeah one of you uh, elephants looking for water. Elephants looking for water. Yes, so elephants do migrate. They, they may be looking for water or food um, uh, and other resources. Yeah, that's a good example. And was there somebody else? Oh, yeah, I said Canadian geese. 
Right, Canadian geese and a lot of um, a lot of birds actually are well known for migration as well. Can Canada? Sorry. Oh, apparently it is Canada geese, not Canadian Canadian geese. I didn't know that. Um, did you have? All right, no worries. So um, yeah, so that uh, that was all. They were all good examples of migration and, and um, yes. Yeah. Um, technically, uh, well, it is a uh, uh, Cyclic move. So, did, did everyone hear the question? Um, so, Jamie was asking uh, that in monarch butterflies, the, the migration is um, so the, the ones that migrate from south to north are of different generation, and then the ones that um, move from, that migrate from north to south are of different generation. Would that count as migration? Um, uh, we're going to talk about the monarch butterfly. Uh, uh, migration uh, again for those for those of you who don't know much about it, uh, but I think it still uh, does count as migration. Um, and um, remind me, Jamie, when we are on that slide, I'll ask uh, the students why they think it is it should be considered um, as as migration. All right, so uh, we learned about migration. Does anybody know what dispersal is? How does dispersal differ from migration? They don't go back. Yeah, that's correct. So there was an answer here, but uh, and, and there was somebody else here uh, who said they don't go back. Yeah, they're both they're both right. So typically, dispersal means you you don't have a destination per se. So uh, as in as in migration, you go to a certain place for whatever resources for whatever reasons you go there, and then you return back. But with dispersal, usually you don't have a uh, destination per se, and it, and it's and it's typically permanent. And for example, um, uh, younger uh, individuals dispersing away from the parents or, or the colony where uh, they were born, if they're social animals and so as to avoid uh, inbreeding. And it could happen in, uh, in different kinds of um, animals and birds as well. All right. Why migrate? What are the benefits of mi migration? Does um, anybody want to give it a, give it a go? What, what are the benefits of uh, animals migrating? Why, why do animals want to migrate? You go to ideal climates for yourself. That's, that's correct. Uh, typically, uh, a lot of animals actually do this and they, they need to avoid harsh weather. Uh, and so they need to be, they, they're probably not adapted to live in these harsh uh, weather conditions that they are currently uh, at. And so they typically migrate to a place that can um, where they can live uh, or, or, or feed comfortably. Any other benefits of migration or reasons reasons for migration? Why do um, why do whales migrate, for example? Why do uh, elephants migrate? There was some somebody mentioned it already. This is after for resources. For resources, yeah, that, that that's uh, that's a good one. And typically, um, they may be fluctuations in resources in the place where you are, or at the time uh, uh, of where you are, right? Typically, there may be spatial temporal variation in in, in resources uh, resources, and so. At that time, for that season, maybe there is no food for you in the place where you are, and so you, uh, for you to, uh, it is better for you to migrate in, in that case. Uh, and similarly, um, spatially, for example, um, if you consider the long longitude of the of the Earth, there may be um, resources that are spatially distributed along the longitude, and depending on the season, depending on 
how much has been uh, how much of the resources have been used up you might have different distributions of resources and so you just move through the area of where, where there are more resources um, and similarly if you are an animal that lives along the altitude uh, for example on mountain ranges so you may you may run out of food um, on top of the mountain and you might want to migrate down to altitudinally migrate down to the mountain so these these, these could be typically short distance uh, migrations and and similarly you could you could have uh, 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 used up all the resources in the foothills and so you migrate up um, um, in in the elevation as well um, any other reason I know whales migrate to um, like to find a place to calf, like to give birth. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. Yeah, uh, find a place to raise the young ones. Find a place to find mates as well, right? So you may you may have different populations uh, uh, migrating, and different uh, uh, individuals mixing up, and and you might get to uh, find a mate. Um, um, as you migrate and you might get to uh, take care of your young ones in, in a different um, different region when you migrate. Um, right, so I think we covered most of the points um, that I wanted to tell um, to find. Uh, so sometimes you might also migrate in order to avoid predators um, as well. Um, and so if you, um, and you might be able to find food or mates or resources um, uh, when you migrate. And you might be able to adapt to resources that fluctuate spatial temporarily, like all the examples that I gave you, um, how, um, and how you can adapt to that and to avoid, I think the, the most common one is to avoid the harsh uh, weather as well. And what are the costs involved in, in migration? We just discussed all the benefits. What do you think are the costs involved in the migration behavior for an animal? Physical toll. Physical toll, yeah, that's a good one. Um, so some examples can act, uh, some, sorry, some animals can actually migrate as far as uh, 60,000 kilometers a year. Um, so we're gonna look at that example uh, in, the, in the class today. Um, and that's just one of the extreme examples. And there, there are a lot of animals that uh, can actually migrate thousands of kilometers and hundreds of kilometers. And in order to be able to do that, you should have uh, enough uh, energy resources, enough uh, uh, resources, and, you, and that's one of your costs, your metabolic costs, so to say. Yeah, what other um, costs are there for migration? Um, uh, so the answer was you could lose your habitat. Uh, in what way? Right, so the answer was, uh, if you're a bird, you might have to leave the uh, nest and some other animal might uh, take over that nest when you, when you migrate. Um, well, uh, Partly true, I, I suppose, um, and it also depends on the species. So most of the times, they don't get reused per se, and also they're uh, leaving because if they're leaving, it's typically the whole population that moves as well. So you might not have the same kind of species. Um, um, might, uh, some species staying, and some some of them are moving. Um, but uh, but that, that does raise a raise a question. You might actually lose your territory. Uh, rather instead of uh, the nest. So if you're a territorial animal, again, we're gonna discuss territoriality in the next class, you might lose your territory and then, and then you have to, you're moving and then when you come back, you have to reestablish your whole territory again. Um, yeah, what other costs are there? What else can you think of? Predation. What? Sorry? Like predation, like the uh, passenger pigeon, there was millions of them and Humans wiped them out, shooting giant cannons and nets up in the air, and and just just yes. billions of them, and they wiped them out with human predation. Not to mention hawks and other things. I'm sure. 
yeah, that, that is a good example as well. Predation, uh, in addition to human predation, there's a lot of uh, animals that can predate on you. You're walking in a territory that, that you've never been uh, to, typically, you've uh, you're probably never been to, and, and you're in an unknown territory, and there could be different predators uh, waiting for you there. And, and uh, um, one of the uh, vivid examples of this is um, wildebeest migration. There's a lot of predation. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about that when we get to the get to the slide. Um, right. And what other costs? Can you think of any other costs? Food, energy costs. Food yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that was covered. Energy costs as well. And also to add to that, you could get starved. You, you might be migrating and you don't know if there's a food along the way. You know that there may be food at the end of your journey, but is there food along the way? What if there's no food? And what if there's no water, right? So you might, uh, you might die of desiccation. You might die of thirst, right? Um, I think we covered most of the uh, cause. Um, uh, predation uh, is one of the cause. Uh, you have metabolic cause and you could, uh, could die of starvation or, or thirst. Um, and you also have time costs. Maybe, so the time spent in migration could have been spent doing uh, other things, um, for example, foraging in the same area, if you, um, um, if you could actually forage in the area where you were, um, or if you, you could have mated in that time, because typically a lot of migration uh, tasks are, uh, they take time and they take uh, energy uh, as well. So that's another cost. And if you're, if you're an animal that couldn't navigate well, you could also get lost. And now you're lost, you don't have food, you don't know where to get back, you don't know how to get back, you might just have to like find your way, right? One of the ways uh, uh, some animals actually um, overcome this is uh, to migrate in groups. And so you typically just follow um, an individual or follow a group of individuals. Uh, what are the alternatives to migration? We just looked at the costs and benefits of migration. If the benefits outweigh the costs, it might be better to migrate. But what if the costs outweigh the benefits? What are the alternatives for an animal? Hibernation. That's a good one, hibernation. What is hibernation? Where an animal just hunkers down and goes to sleep until the temperature gets better. That's correct. Um, um, and what's the opposite of uh, hibernation uh, uh, for extreme heat conditions? I think some animals uh, dehydrate themselves and go into just um, a sleep. Right, what's the, they don't dehydrate. Um, well, they, they do it because they don't want to get dehydrated in, a, in an extreme heat condition. Well, I, I'm looking for the term, uh, I'm looking for the name, like hibernation. What's the other thing that the animals do when the hibernation is done when they're in an extreme cold area? And what's the word? or uh, the si similar thing where you reduce your metabolic cost uh, in extreme drought or heat area. Torpor. Torpor. Um, or euthermia. Uh, what is torpor actually? I, I... Right, so uh, torpor is uh, when the body temperature goes down to amb ambient temperature. Right, right. Um, all right, so I, I, I think I, I can give, give away the answer. It's called aestivation. Um, it's basically like hibernation, but, uh, hibernation, uh, but um, when you are in an extreme heat condition. So those are some alternatives. Some animals do use them as well, uh, but, uh, but a lot of animals do uh, migrate instead, depending on the cost benefit, um, costs and benefits to them for the migration. What's All right. The word estivation. Yeah, estivation. E S T I V A T I O N. Estivation. All right. So an animal. Uh, so for an animal, the benefits outweigh costs. For example, uh, uh, consider that the benefits outweigh the cost. And now it has to be able to navigate. It has to be able to migrate. How does it know when to migrate? How does an animal know? 
when to migrate. Environmental cues. Good one. Like what? What kind of environmental cues? Uh, temperature changes. Temperature changes, yeah. What else? Change in sunlight. Sunlight, yeah. Good one as well. What other environmental changes can an animal detect to know when to migrate? Resources, yeah, that's an important one that you can easily uh, detect. You don't have food, you don't have anything to do there and you have to migrate to find food, um, yeah. You, uh, I, think, I think in the last few classes, you've been thinking of um, hormones. Um, can you think of uh, uh, physiological reasons or a physiolog physiological causes of um, uh, migration, like physiological um, processes that let the animal know when to migrate? Anybody? Shorter day. Shorter day, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's an uh, external cue, environmental cue that they can use, that you, uh, they can use. And you might be able to detect the changes in the, in the uh, time of the day, uh, in the duration of the uh, daylight. Uh, and that might actually trigger some internal signals, in, uh, perhaps uh, release of certain hormones right, the certain hormones that uh, are involved in say reproduction and hunger are known to um, uh, initiate migration or, or, or stimulate migration behavior in animals. And there may also be other internal signals, could be uh, something like internal rhythms that tell them to migrate um, at a particular um, uh, duration. Uh, and there may be changes in metabolic patterns of the animal just before the migration. Could be something like um, uh, more fat accumulation in their body tissue. Um, so if they were to mig migrate, they would need to use all of that fat reserves and, uh, um, to be able to migrate as, um, um, as well. And so, uh, and just before uh, migration, they may have release of hormones um, that are involved in, um, um, in accumulating fat in the body tissues. And we also talked about the external or environmental signals. I think you guys covered most of them, changes in daylight hours and temperature and resource um, availability as well. Any questions so far? All right, move on. All right, so now that we know why animals migrate, how they know when to migrate, now, how do they migrate? How do animals migrate? And they, in order to migrate, they need to be able to navigate, right? So we, we, we uh, define migration as a, as a cyclical uh, movement, right? They should be able to go from A to B and B to A um, in most cases. How do they navigate? Think of examples of migration uh, migrations uh, that you gave and then think of how they navigate from one place to another. Remember all the examples that you guys gave? Monarch butterflies, whales, and um, elephants. How do they know how to migrate how to, or how to navigate from A to B and B to A? Butterflies remember landmarks, right? They use along the way. Who? Landmarks. The, ele the oh, elephants? You feel like butterflies. Butterflies, um, landmarks, yes, uh, uh, visual landmarks. Uh, landmarks could be visual or um, what other landmarks can you think of? Are there other kinds of landmarks that animals can use? The sun. The sun, yeah, sun is, is, a, is a cue, yeah. Um, I meant to say uh, olfactory landmarks as well. So. If you, if you live in an area where they're making, say, cookies in a factory, or, uh, yeah, I think we call them cookies here, um, cookies oh, in a factory. Polarized light. Sorry? Polarized light. Who was that? Polarized right. light, getting direction right. from polarized right. Uh, light. Right, polarized light is, is one of the cues as well. Um, um, yeah, so I was, I was mentioning olfactory landmarks, so you might have um, 
So if you walk uh, across a cafe, you might have a smell of it. And so if you're an animal, you might use that as a landmark um, as well. Um, yeah, so people covered visual and olfactory landmarks so far. Um, what other things did you cover? Polarized light is one of them. How do uh, you navigate? Birds use like the magnetic field of the earth. Magnetic field, yeah, that's that's a very good one. And a lot of animals are uh, shown to use magnetic field uh, um, uh, orientation or the magnetic field intensity um, of, of the earth as well. How do you mag uh, 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 navigate as a human? Uh, Google Maps, yeah, mm -hmm. maps is, is, yeah, maps is a very um, uh, useful uh, navigation tool. Um, and animals, there, there, there is a debate as to whether animals can use it. And I'll, I'll come to, uh, to men well, not, but yeah, whether, yeah, that, that's not the debate, whether or not the animals can use Google Maps, obviously not, unless you teach your, um, your cat to use your Google Map, I don't know. Well, um, some people think that uh, birds can follow the star patterns. Star patterns, yeah, these are celestial cues. Um, that you can use. Are you able to see my slides? Uh, is, is it just one slide that you're able to see or more than one? In, in Zoom people. Uh, we see one slide at a time. So we see the current slide you're on. How do we have okay. integrate? Okay, because you're, you're covering most of the points that I had, which is really good. Um, all right, so yeah, so stars is another thing. And so I think we covered maps um, and they might be able to use compass. Uh, and the compass could be of uh, any kind. You could get a compass uh, direction. So basically use a compass to know the direction. So you could use uh, Earth's magnetic field, or you could use celestial cues such as the, uh, the stars or the position of the sun. I think somebody said sun as well. And you could use olfactory cues. You could use visual landmarks. So uh, uh, visual landmarks could include so many things. And it could be like coastline or mountain range if you are looking at really huge um, visual, visual cues in, in the panorama. Um, right, so, um, and, and then there are animals that can use the position of the sun, position of the moon, and also the Milky Way, the orientation of the Milky Way galaxy. The, does anybody know which animal can use this? There, there are a few animals, like, like one example of who uses uh, the orientation of Milky Way galaxy for navigation. Turtles? Um, I'm not quite sure. What was the other one? The monarch? The monarch butterfly. I am not quite sure of that either. Um, so the sure example that I know of is uh, are a few species of beetles, nocturnal beetles, and they can actually use um, the, the orientation of this Milky Way galaxy and, if you, and how it changes over, over time. They can use that to like to uh, navigate in a straight line direction uh, from the dung pile. So these are dung beetles. So they're typically getting away with the, uh, from the dung pile with uh, as much dung as they can take. And then they shoot away because other dung beetles are trying to snatch the dung from them. It's a good resource for them. Um, right, so, and then the other um, cue that I think Jerry mentioned is, is uh, star uh, patterns. If you're a hiker, if you're a camper, you might know how to use the stars to, um, to navigate. I don't know how to use um, uh, the stars for navigation, but you can actually tell which direction is north depending on where you see a, a certain constellation. And then the other examples are the Earth's magnetic field. As you can see, um, so this is a representation of uh, Earth's magnetic, uh, magnetic field lines around the Earth. Um, and you, at any place on the earth, you, you can actually um, uh, detect the uh, magnetic field. Uh, some animals can, uh, I mean, um, and to say which direction they, ha they have to walk uh, or they have to fly to be able to reach um, a destination. Um, all right, so how, can anybody tell me, suppose if I say that a bird uses star patterns to navigate, right, it, during night. How would you test this? How would you take a bird, you have a bird with you, and somebody told that it uses star patterns. 
to navigate from say to north direction. That's a that's a typical path. So how would you test this? Give it a give it a try. It can be wrong. It's not a problem. You're allowed to be wrong. I mean, put them in. Uh, what do you call that? Uh, where you those indoor things? What do you call it? Where you see the stars inside a building? I can't think of the term. Right, planetarium. Planetarium. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Um, a, a lot of yeah, uh, uh, bird experiments have been conducted inside a planetarium, so you can. In the planetarium, you can change the position of uh, certain uh, galaxies or, or or the stars, and then see how a, how a bird um, navigates. Right. Um, all right. So these are some of the ways that animals can uh, migrate. Uh, let's look at some of uh, uh, examples of um, how different animals migrate. So the monarch butterfly uh, migration, which uh, some of you brought up. Um, if you already don't know, monarch butterflies uh, uh, life, uh, one generation um, uh, um, goes for about a month and they lay eggs and, and, then, uh, and then they develop into larvae for a few days and then they become pupae or chrysalis and then the adults emerge from there, right? And so typically um, they overwinter, they, they spend the winter in, in certain parts of uh, uh, Mexico and then they in, in spring, they migrate up north, and they all, um, so I'll come to these two uh, uh, points as well, but um, typically they navigate up north during uh, spring, and then they, they go to the northern regions of the United States during summer to breed there, right? And once they breed, the, um, so see here you can actually see different um, um, migrations. There's winter, uh, wintering in Mexico, and that's the first generation of butterflies, and then they, and then during the spring migration, there are three more generations of these butterflies. So they laid eggs, and then they, and then they become larvae, they become pupae, and then the new adults emerge. So during this uh, uh, spring migration, there have been three generations of these butterflies, and then during uh, during the fall, they start migrating down south again to exactly, almost exactly the same location of, of uh, in, the, in the forest um, in, in Mexico uh, to overwinter there, to spend their winter there. So they're not really coming down here for, um, for uh, food per se, they're just coming there to uh, um, overwinter, so to say, and they, they typically breed in summer. So this is a major population of these uh, butterflies that does this, and there are a small population butterflies that are over winter in California and also um, Southern uh, Florida as well. And so I think coming back to what Jamie was asking, so the individuals that started uh, going from Mexico were zero, zero uh, generation. And the ones by the time they, they migrate down, the ones that are migrating down are the great, great grandchildren of these, these uh, butterflies, right? And, so, and these great great grandchildren have never been to Mexico or to the Southern Florida or, or to Southern California, right? Uh, so the question was, is this migration? It's over different generations, but is this, do, would you still define this as migration? Yes. Right. <laughs> Anybody yeah. else? Why, why would that be uh, uh, migration? Because populations exist as a species, not as individuals. And it doesn't matter whether it's you as an individual, we exist over generations as a species. Um. Uh, there were a few um, mix up of words there, but uh, but yeah, so typically migration could be an individual or a population uh, that migrates on, from one place to another. And so these are these different, uh, this is a different population and this is a different population. And they've, uh, 
they have a different migratory routes as well um, in these different uh, populations. And, and one of the good things uh, about it is that depending on which population you're studying, you may be able to manipulate um, the, uh, you may be able to conduct experiments in order to understand what makes them migrate to a particular place, right? And how do they know how to get here to Southern Florida and not here if their grandparents, uh, if the zero generation was, was from here, right? And so you can actually uh, use differences in population level uh, migration in order to um, uh, investigate migration behaviors. All right. Um, now that we know that the fourth generation that had never been to, so assuming uh, the, the, most of them went to Mexico, that they had never been here, how did they manage to navigate? They don't know where this particular patch of forest is, but they still navigated it. How did they manage to navigate so precisely? It's in their genetics? It is, it, it is likely in their genetic. It is, what, what's the other word that you can use to encompass um, more, a lot of other? Instincts? Instinct, yeah. It's a good one. Um, so it, it could be an instinctive uh, behavior and could be uh, um, coded in the genetics. I, I think it's still not very clear. The research on this one is still um, not very clear. And what kind of cues do they use to navigate? I think you, you, some of you already mentioned uh, some of the cues that they can use. Uh, one of them is the Earth's magnetic uh, um, um, orientation. Um, magnetic field orientation. Um, so each place on the earth has a slightly different magnetic uh, intensity and the orientation, uh, magnetic field orientation. And you can use that to, to kind of know which direction to uh, move towards. And the way uh, uh, scientists um, can figure this out is you can put a pin, you can glue the butterfly to a small pin so it is free to fly, you can flap its wing and you change the, um, so you let it migrate, you let it migrate as in fly uh, in, in, in one place uh, in a particular direction. And then you change the magnetic field and see whether it, it actually reverses the um, magnet, uh, direction in which uh, it was flying before. And that's how you know that they may be able to use magnetic um, orientation, magnetic field, um, uh, information to navigate. And the other example is um, the position of the sun. The, a lot of animals can actually use the position of the sun to navigate. Um, and then if, if, it's a, if it's a cloudy day, what would you do? You can't see the sun, what would you do? Uh, lights are on the city. Field. Unlikely. What? Use the magnetic field. Magnetic field. Yeah, that's one of them. So typically they use more than one uh, kind of cues, but um, they can also use something called the polarized uh, pattern of light around the sun. Um, so typically when the light enters, light is an electromagnetic wave, right? So it may be oscillated, the electric component of the uh, the wave may be oscillating in different directions if it's an unpolarized light. And if you pass it through a, a, pol a polarizer, it gets polarized and oscillates in one particular angle, right? And so typically around the sun, you see this kind, of, if this is the sun, you see a kind of a, a pattern of this polarized light um, around the sun. And so we, I think humans aren't uh, very, humans aren't sensitive for this kind of uh, uh, polarized light pattern, but a lot of animals like insects can um, uh, detect this, uh, uh, this pattern of polarized light around the sun. So even if it's a cloudy day, you can still detect this, uh, this pattern around the, around the sun. And you can use that to be able to say, I have to walk, I have to fly in this direction or, or, or something like that. Right, um, and so, so this is a, here you can see a butterfly in, in that kind of tethered uh, flight. 
and it's flying at an angle to this light, this particular light. And as and as soon as you shift the position of the light here, it it may uh, um, uh, perceive it as a sun, as sun, for example. It reorients itself and then it um, uh, flies in in a direction relative to this uh, this um, LED light there. So that's one of the ways. Um, that people actually, uh, scientists actually uh, try to understand how they navigate. All right, um, and they, are, they also use wind uh, to save energy um, as well. So they may just uh, uh, passively get uh, uh, use wind to fly in certain directions as well, so that allows them. And so this is an example of innate behavior of innate ability to migrate. There are also animals that can migrate um, through learning. So one of the uh, best examples for this is um, uh, elephants migrating in dry seasons. They typically migrate for tens of kilometers, maybe over hundred uh, kilometers. Um, and they, they're basically looking for food and, and water. Uh, and they are led by a matriarch, typically. It's a female um, head that uh, uh, leads this uh, group of uh, elephants. And over time, over a few um, migration events, some of the other uh, individuals of the group also learn the path that they have to take to be able to find water and to be able to find um, um, food in the right place. And so this is an example of um, uh, learned migration behavior, learning the, uh, the path to navigate. Another uh, interesting uh, um, example is turtle migration. And so when the turtles uh, hatch in, in a beach, they use visual cues such as the coastline uh, or the waves uh, to be able to walk towards the, um, towards the ocean. And then once they're in water, they use the wave direction to move perpendicular to them. And then once they're inside the open ocean, they start to use magnetic uh, orientation um, to uh, to be uh, to know which direction they're going to, because after they mature, they often come back to the same exact same beach where they were born. Uh, this could be after many months or many years, um, and then they lay eggs in the same beach where uh, they were born and again. So the way they do it is uh, is uh, using a magnetic field uh, as a compass. Uh, and can anybody tell me, how do you test whether a turtle can use magnetic uh, field as a compass? Do you know what a Helmholtz coil is? All right. So, uh, what you can use is something called Helmholtz coil. So this is a coil and this is a platform. That's a tiny turtle there. Uh, it's um, attached to something. It's free to move uh, in, a, in a particular direction, but it can't exit this platform, uh, for example. Uh, Helmholtz coil is basically just a, a coil of uh, uh, conducting wire. Um, and then you run um, current through it and it generates a magnetic field. So these are iron filings to just visualize the magnetic fields um, of created uh, here um, with this one wire. And in a Helmholtz coil, you have multiple of these um, rings. And then you, inside the coil, you can create a uniform, uh, uniformly directed um, uh, magnetic field or, um, uh, within that. And now, so if you, if the, if you, uh, so if it's just using the geomagnetic field, the Earth's magnetic field, uh, they, they tested how, uh, which direction the turtles go, and most of them go in this direction as uh, shown here, like on average, they, they walk in this direction. And now they can reverse the, Earth, uh, the magnetic field by changing the um, magnetic field orientation using the Helmholtz coil, um, as you would expect if they were to use the magnetic um, orientation they go in almost exactly in the opposite direction. As you can see, using the, this is the average direction that the, that the turtles took. All right. So another aquatic example is salmon. Um, I don't know how many of you like salmon. You're probably remembering the smell 
of uh, salmon right now just by looking at that picture. Um, and that's, that's an important uh, cue that animals can use. So I don't know, um, maybe if your grandma used to make cookies um, and whenever you smell those cookies as an adult, you, it probably reminds you of your grandma's um, kitchen, for example. And so that's an olfactory imprinting that you probably may have had or, or olfactory memory, so to say. Um, and so these salmon are born in fresh water and then they migrate uh, into the salt water, into the sea. Um, and when they have to spawn, when they have to um, uh, spawn, they come back to the same uh, location in the freshwater uh, region or the river, or part of the river where they were born and then they spawn there and then, and then they die, right? And, um, and so when they're at the mouth of the river when they're about to enter the, um, the ocean, they sort of remember the magnetic field, uh, uh, latitude and longitude of the magnetic field at that uh, point to be able to use that to come back, right? So they, they need to be able to come back to the same river and then same location where they were born. And so when they are returning, they use the Earth's magnetic field to return to the, uh, the same rivulet or, or river where, um, where they grew up. And once they're in that river, in the fresh water, they use the olfactory memory. So they could have remembered the salinity or the temperature or the chemical composition of the water there and, and, and use that to navigate up, um, up a, a river and then, and then they spawn there. Um, right, and so this is uh, really important for the conservation uh, uh, efforts as well, or if you want to like, um, um, catch more salmon, because if you change the composition of the river, if you pollute the river, for example, it might change the chemical composition. And if the, if the fish um, had a different smell uh, imprinted uh, um, when it was young, and it won't be able to find its way back and it might get lost and it might just die um, looking for uh, the right direction um, to go to its um, birthplace. Um, also sorry. Also, damn, damn, damn. The problems with them. Right, damn, damn is another. Uh, yeah. Um, right. So we looked at a lot of examples, and uh, whales is is, uh, is a is a famous one as well. Um, um, so I've given an example of Australian uh, whales, humpback whales. Um, uh, they feed in Antarctica, and then they travel up north to South Pacific region and along the coast of Australia. And there are other species of whales. Um, this one is called southern uh, right whale. They, um, they, they navigate uh, in, uh, in slightly different uh, parts as well. And each of them might use different um, cues to navigate. And this one is, is a record breaking uh, exa um, example of uh, migration. So this seabird called Sooty Shearwater. It typically breeds in New Zealand and it can travel over 60,000 miles per year, which is really, um, um, for an animal that size, you need to have so many resources, uh, so much energy, so much cost to be able to do that. And if it's doing that, it has to have certain benefits um, um, in, in why it does um, uh, navigate that long. And here you can see two of these birds radio tagged. So you can, so they, have, they had attached, uh, uh, scientists had attached tags to them to, uh, to uh, track them. So these are the paths taken by two of these birds. One of them went to Japan, um, first went to South America and then Japan and then got back to New Zealand. The other one went to South America and then California and then back again. So this is a remarkable example of um, what some animals are capable of uh, when it comes to um, migration. Right, um, this brings us to uh, uh, homing pigeons. Uh, this is not exactly a migration story per se, but I just wanted to um, give you an example of how different birds um, uh, navigate over shorter distances. And so these are parts taken by certain, uh, so the same uh, individuals. These are two different individuals over different days. Uh, and so they typically follow the same route that they had uh, uh, taken uh, time and again. And a lot of times they can use um, visual cues on the ground uh, to be able to decide where to, uh, where to navigate. And they may also use something like uh, a highway. 
um, uh, or, or a huge road because it's like a really clear um, um, a visual cue for them to use, and they can just follow that particular highway, and then they they can um, um, they can uh, navigate and home. Um, homing is basically going back to your nest or or the home. And uh, an interesting so this is um, studying this bird is important because it can actually tell us um, how birds can use magnetic field uh, for um, uh, for navigation. And so the way they studied this is they put a, a magnetic coil. So they put a hat with some sort of magnetic coil uh, and see, uh, so if you turn off the coil, if you, if you just let it be, uh, it navigates in a particular direction, right? Um, so it's navigating on an overcast day. So they're not using other uh, solar cues, for example. And if you turn on the coil and then it'll, change the magnetic field orientation just around its head. And now the bird actually travels in exactly the opposite direction um, that it's supposed to do. And so this is one of the uh, ways that people try to study um, how they navigate. And, um, and so people also, uh, there have been hypotheses um, that there are some magnetic particles called magnetite in their eyes or in their, uh, in their beaks of the, uh, of the birds. And they use that, that's the approximate mechanism of uh, how they can use magnetic field to, uh, to navigate. All right, so uh, I think uh, this is probably my last example. And it's, this is the most majestic example as well. So these are wildebeest. Uh, I don't know if you've seen them. Um, and they migrate in millions. There are so many animals. It's a mass migration event that happens uh, and they, uh, they migrate from uh, Serengeti to Masai Mara, um, so some part of Tanzania to, towards, um, towards Kenya. And, and they, uh, so this event happens, when this event happens, a lot of animals are actually migrating together, could be wildebeest and um, zebras and so on, um, elephants as well sometimes. Um, and so this particular mass migration event apparently is uh, triggered by uh, low levels of nutrients in, in the grass. And so if they detect that uh, that's a hypothesis that is, uh, that is uh, still being um, tested, I suppose, um, that, uh, that can actually trigger this mass migration even uh, looking for uh, better grazing areas. And so when, they, uh, when they're migrating, obviously, if you remember the cause, they have to pass through really dangerous territory most of the time. They, may, they may have to drink in crocodile infested water and typically hundreds of thousands of animals die. And this is actually a mass migration even that leads, that can actually feed so many other animals, um, predators um, as well. Uh, I'll just show you a, a quick uh, video on this one. Each year, the Serengeti Plains in Tanzania play host to one of the greatest animal migrations on Earth. Some two million animals begin a round trip to take them almost 2,000 miles. Fossil evidence suggests that modern wildebeest grazed these plains more than a million years ago. At the beginning of each year, the wildebeest congregate on the fringes of the Serengeti, all giving birth in the same month. Rapidly, their numbers swell. The calves can run as fast as their mothers within two days of being born. No one knows what triggers the migration. There is no discernible signal. It just takes one or two to sniff the air and decide the time is right to leave. The migrating animal's journey is a long and arduous one. Even without the attention of predators, around 200,000 of the weakest wildebeest and zebras will die from starvation, disease, or overexertion during the trek. Every day, fresh carcasses are left behind. The migrating animals rest at the swollen streams and regroup. Those are the cost involved in this migration.
A single cat finds it tricky to bring down a full grown wildebeest. But if it can separate a wildebeest cat all from its mother, then it has a chance of a meal. All right. Um, I think this is an old documentary, but one of the latest uh, hypotheses is that they may be detecting the um, level of nutrients in, in the food that they're eating. Um, and, and so this was just to show you um, how uh, majestic this kind of um, uh, migration is and how many in animals are actually involved in there, how uh, predators actually thrive um, uh, based on this event. All right. Um, there are a lot of other examples. I can I can't go through uh, each one of them, but um, uh, and birds are one of the most uh, famous migrators. So I don't know if you've seen these kind of patterns of migratory birds, uh, and so they're apparently using aerodynamic uh, dynamics to be able to conserve energy. And so one of them leads in the front, and so the others can uh, can use less energy for flying. And there's also human migration. Um, could, it could be because of geopolitical um, or economic reasons, but some people also migrate to Florida, for example, for its weather, uh, but it's, uh, it's a slightly different kind of migration, so we're not getting into that. Um, all right, uh, I think we have some more time, so we will um, get into the proximate mechanisms of how animals can migrate. And some of the fundamental problems of uh, navigation when you're migrating or when you're just navigating from home to your nest or home to your, uh, home to your food source and then back to your home uh, is to be able to know where you are um, and how to get from A to B and how to reorient when you're uh, lost. So I'll give you some examples uh, to illustrate some of these points. Uh, one of the... Uh, the uh, well-known examples of how animals uh, orient is using landmarks for navigation. And so this is a very famous example uh, uh, experiment done by Nico Timbojan, who was one of the three Nobel laureates um, uh, who got Nobel Prize for their work in animal behavior. So these, this is a, a digger wasp uh, that lives um, in sandy areas and it nests in sand. So the nest is typically just a small hole uh, in the ground and it has to go, it has to fly and forage and then come back again uh, and find this nest. So if you're this fly, if you're this uh, wasp, you would um, have difficulty finding out which hole is your nest. Like there may be so many other uh, holes on the, on, the, uh, on, on the beach or on the, on the sand. And so what Nico Timbojan did, uh, what he hypothesized is that they may be using landmarks around the, uh, the nest entrance to be able to decide, to be able to um, uh, navigate exactly to their nest uh, entrance. So what it did is he provided these pine cones as uh, landmarks around the nest. And so when the wasp exits and it flies back and then it, it looks around, so it does something called learning flight. It learns what the landmarks are. So it knows it has a mental template of uh, where the landmarks are with respect to the nest entrance. And when it returns back, what Nico, uh, what Nico Timbojan did was he moved this uh, uh, pattern of uh, landmarks to the side. And so now if it were to be using these uh, pine cones as uh, a landmark, they would search in the middle or in the center of this, uh, this pattern. And that's exactly what he finds. And so he concluded that they use landmarks um, to find their nest. And another example, uh, again, uh, in uh, insects, uh, in this case, it's ants, is they can actually use landmarks and panorama, the patterns in the panorama. So this is a nest entrance, the yellow thing here. And this is the panorama that they see as, as they get out of the nest entrance. So the nest is just in, um, in it's just a hole in the ground again. And so what they thought, uh, uh, what Graham and, uh, and Cheng did was, um, they recreated this panorama using plastic and sticks. And that's what you see here. And so they were traveling, they had a direction where they usually travel for food and they were just traveling there. And what they did uh, uh, after some, uh, some training of, um, after training the ants to go to one direction uh, to forage, they rotated the whole panorama. So 
they just lifted the whole thing and then rotated it. And then they, they saw that they, they were using the pattern of these landmarks to walk in the direction where they're supposed to go. So this is the direction that, they, that the food is actually uh, at, but this is the direction that they go instead of in this direction because they were using the pattern of this panorama to know which direction to walk to. All right. Um, uh, which I think we still have like five minutes. Should I? Should I? Okay. I, I'm gonna uh, go uh, for a few more minutes, um, and then we can continue in the next class. So the other uh, uh, important um, um, navigational tool set that uh, animals have is mental or cognitive maps. Uh, like I told you in the beginning. Um, they can't use Google Maps, they can use Google Maps. We also have mental maps as well. Um, so mental map is basically, you're here in the classroom, uh, your friend is at the Green Library and you have to describe how he or she has to get here. So you get, you, in order to do that, you have a mental picture of where this building is related to that building and you have to think of what are the paths that the person can take to get to you, right? So that's an example of having a cognitive or mental map. And so they tested whether rats have this. And so this is a maze uh, in which they release a rat and they put uh, some food uh, reward here. And so the rats learn to uh, navigate and then get the food. So they train the rats to do this for, for a few times. Now, if it knows the, if it has a mental map of this orientation that it has uh, been trained to, it would know that if you walk in this direction, you can easily get the food as long as there is a path that takes you there, right? And so to test whether the rats can use uh, mental maps, they trained them in this uh, setup, but they gave them this setup where um, they had different uh, tunnels that they could uh, walk through to find the goal. And so if the goal is in this direction, which is what uh, uh, it would have uh, inferred if it uh, had a mental map, it would walk in this uh, in this direction, right? If you release the rat here, and if it didn't have a, a mental map, it was if it was just using this uh, walking in this direction uh, all the time, then it would go in this direction. What they found found was that they actually use uh, this direction, so they have sort of a mental map of where is what around their, uh, the environment that they just um, explored. Um, and the, how do they do that? Like the way they do it neurally is something uh, really fascinating. Um, uh, they use something called play cells, which are in the hippocampus region of their, of their brain. Um, so basically these are cells in, in the, uh, these are neurons in the hippocampus uh, that tell you the position that get activated uh, at a certain position in the environment. Suppose if, uh, if I'm a rat in this room, I have some cells, some uh, place cells in my brain that are that are active, that are that are firing when I'm at this place. And if I move to a different part of the room, another another uh, uh, particular place cell gets activated, and and, and so, so on. So you kind of get a map of uh, the whole area where you're at. And if I, if I were to move outside this uh, building, now I'm navigating in uh, on campus, right? Now I would have uh, the same uh, place cells being reused to indicate different uh, places in my environment, right? So here um, you can see the way you can uh, learn this is you can insert um, electrodes into the hippocampus uh, um, um, with the place cells of the, of the mouse. And then you can visualize um, the, the activity or, or firing of these uh, play cells as a rat explores in this uh, square arena here. So here they're measuring uh, 10 different cells, 10 different play cells. And you can see that as it explores, it's sped up. As it explores, this particular neuron is always activated when the rat is here. This colored neuron is always activated when the rat is around here. And this colored is activated when it's here and, and so on. So each of these places have different place cells that uh, get uh, activated and that kind of tells them where they are. So that's a, that's a way for an animal to know where they are with respect to their environment. Is that, uh, is that clear? Does anybody have any questions? What was the, uh, the panorama 
one. Where was the uh, what, what animal was that for? There, where they changed the panorama. Was that's that that's an ant. Time? That's an ant. So the ant, uh, the ant's nest is over there, and that's the panorama. And so you, you've just uh, unfolded into 360 degrees there. That's the image of that. So this is this is like a, a panoramic picture of the surroundings of this ant. And so this is what they recreated using plastic and, and sticks. So, and, and you can unfold this so like in your uh, panorama mode of your camera. And so they just rotated the whole thing. And so that shifts the panorama in, in this particular patterns. And they were using say, how does, um, I should be walking say in between this thing and this thing to find food, right? And now if you move it, it moves uh, accordingly, like however much angle, whatever angle that you moved it, uh, the ants actually change their path accordingly. That shows that they can use uh, panorama. Any other questions? Did everyone get uh, the place cell uh, example? Yes, no? Yes or no? I got one yes. Um, if you're confused, uh, we can uh, we can continue uh, in the next class uh, with play cells again. Um, but did everyone get it? You can use um, thumbs up. Or how many play cells do they have? I mean, are there like thousands of them, or um, they do? Yeah, they. I I don't know the exact number. I mean, if you're a mammal for we have like billions of um, neurons. There are so many neurons, and so they can uh, they can have a few thousand of them. Uh, but I'm not sure of the exact number, and and they typically can reuse the same uh, place neurons to uh, to show different uh, uh, places. Just like I told you. So for this environment, I might have one particular uh, place cell activated when I'm in this position, but when I'm uh, when I'm uh, navigating on campus. It's a different, uh, the same cell could actually tell me, uh, show me a particular place on campus. So basically that means that that particular cell is activated when I'm in that particular position um, in the environment. So can they follow the place cells even with their eyes shut? Like if they are in the dark? Yes, yes, it can. All right, um, I think we, uh, we are out of time. We will continue again with play cells um, and I'll ask you um, uh, what you understood uh, from this because you didn't, uh, you didn't tell me whether you understood it or not. Um, I can start again with play cells next time. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.